Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Entry Level and Industrial EDS, Quick and Easy Solutions. Before we begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple applications widgets which you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. I'll try to answer these questions to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or if we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. We do capture all questions. A copy of today's slide deck and some additional materials are available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. And here's where I would like to jump in and introduce myself. I am Tara Nilees. I am the Global Applications Manager here at EDAX. And that means I lead a really talented team of scientists around the world who are working with our customers on, in many industries. I've been at EDAX for 20 years now, and that pretty much means that I'm a career microanalyst. And that's something that we're going to be discussing today as we talk about the changing landscape of the microscopy and microanalysis field. I actually started my career in a dedicated microscopy lab in the semiconductor industry where we had several tools as well as several operators, and we did SEM and microanalysis day in and day out. We're really uh, the traditional uh, dedicated microscopists in that field. Now what we're seeing is an emerging field of a new type of analyst. And the motivation for this change is because there are different markets that are growing and finding ways of applying SEM and EDS into the industrial needs. We're also seeing growth in educational sectors, which is really exciting because that means that we're growing scientists even at a younger age. And as any parent could relate, uh, this, uh, this is a good thing where you see your children coming home talking about their latest discoveries. So this year, we're starting off with a new perspective on microscopy. It started late last year when we in the EDAX Application Lab added yet another microscope to our suite of SEMs. And this time, it was a tabletop microscope. And it really took us all in the Application Lab by surprise just how quick and easy it was to use. We're talking just a couple of buttons and icons here to get some really good data. And I started the year also with a blog of the same or similar topic, which you'll notice will be published today with uh, some additional examples and materials. And all of this uh, really was uh, emphasized with some feedback from our Japanese regional manager when he told me last year that he saw nearly a doubling over the next few years. There's, there is likely to be a doubling of the tabletop and entry-level industrial market in the next four or five years. So really exciting to think about how the landscape of the tools are changing and the microanalysts themselves. In today's webinar, we're going to talk about these new market requirements that pair up with the industrial industries that are now discovering the importance and benefits of electron microscopy. And then we're going to show some examples of how the tools that microanalysts use can be used to meet those requirements. We're making today's webinar uh, interactive by having a few polls to capture some of that input on how current users are using your systems and really what's important to all of you all. And we see really a nice uh, mix of attendees. Um, the majority of you guys appear to be from industry uh, with about maybe 35% uh, uh, university. So we have that nice industry and educational mix as well. And while we're at it, I am going to be introducing some uh, terminology and definitions of terms that are important to these new tools. So in the case where we have attendees who are really new to uh, the world of microscopy, you'll also learn something and take away from this, uh, today's webinar. Okay. 
So we'll go ahead and start with a few examples in the industrial analysis world. In industry, there's a variety of processes that are associated with the manufacturing requirements. And these industries may include uh, generally, uh, say, materials or metals, polymers, uh, chemical industries, and textile industries. Uh, from each of those types of industries, we get specific product-focused industries. So automotive manufacturers, semiconductor groups, uh, microelectronics, putting it all together on a printed circuit board. And even from there, say, there are sub-industries that show um, that, that build their whole manufacturing line just on components that support those larger industries. So for example, uh, one of our customers who does some really cool work uh, builds sensors for the automotive industry, and uh, their, their whole group is built up around providing this really valuable benefit uh, directly to the automotive industry. So um, really high um, levels of specific data analysis and types supporting all these industries. But one thing that we could see is some general trends throughout all the diverse industries. They have a production environment or a manufacturing line. And some of the functions that they do where they're exploring now microscopy for in-depth analysis is production line inspections, raw materials verification, and even more of the uh, more regulated QA and QC labs. Failure analysis has been uh, used in the world of SEM and EDS for decades and decades, but now we're even seeing it at a different level, and we'll explain as we go into the details on that topic. And finally, process optimization, and that's where we're looking at materials processing or treatments to obtain the optimal performance, really building your materials so, and your components so that they're at the maximum efficiency or maximum productivity or minimal cost, whatever the goals of the industry are. And here's where I'll just uh, put a, um, a, a concept out for EBSD is one of our techniques that's heavily used in the process optimization labs. We're not going to discuss it today, but uh, it's something that if you're in this aspect of the business, uh, you definitely would want to explore EBSD further. So we'll start off with going into the production environment and specifically production line inspections. And production line inspections is something that's not a regulated part of the process from the manufacturing lab, but rather when, say, an analyst on the production line comes across something and they see something unusual or different, something catches their eye on the production line. And so their thought is, uh-oh, is this something that I need to look at further? What is it? And so from what is it, you could do some visual inspection. Uh, you, of course, can uh, look at it with your eye. And you may see, well, you know what your part is, because of course you see it day in, day out. And so areas might look similar, but you might notice something that uh, is slightly unusual and look at it with an optical microscope. And that gives you a low magnification view, uh, basically a, a higher mag of what your eyes can do. And for many of you, I'm sure you've used your iPhone at a certain point in time where you take your picture of your sample, zoom in on it, and that helps uh, increase the capacity of our eyeballs uh, at a higher magnification, uh, which is a nice little tip. But going to the world of electron microscopy permits a higher magnification where you can take a finer look at your material details. There are also some other benefits with electron microscopy, like looking at the sa sample topography and the surface area um, a little bit deeper. And finally, going into X-ray microanalysis, which uses the electron beam of the electron microscope to generate X-rays from your sample. And it provides a materials characterization, basically what's the chemical composition of it. And then it allows us to gauge how clean is this part that maybe looks a little bit different to us. Is it, is it dirty? Um, or maybe what's the elemental distribution? Let's say, for example, your material is supposed to have equal elements throughout, uh, a glass with sodium dispersed throughout evenly, but do you have hot spots in it? Or even alloy matching. So you know that you're supposed to get a certain type of raw material, a stainless steel type. Um, are you getting the correct one that you ordered when you placed your uh, order in at your supplier? So now we say, OK, what is it? 
with an optical image. And this is where we can use our eyes to look at a sample. And in this case, uh, this is a titanium clip. And somebody on the production line would obviously know what this is because they manufacture these day in, day out. But when they look at it, they could see a little bit closer that there's maybe something that's unusual. Uh, they're not quite sure uh, what exactly it is that's different. Uh, so you could zoom in with an optical microscope to get maybe a little bit more detail. So you could see the finer uh, components, uh, but it's a little bit fuzzy. You, you can only go so far with the optical microscope. So now we turn over to electron microscopy. And now we're actually at the lowest magnification we could get with the electron microscope. And you can see that optical image with zoom gets you so far. But when you go to electron microscope, you're actually starting at the lowest possible mag. And there you can confirm there might be something on that uh, area of that part that's worth looking at further. So we then zoom in. And of course, it's uh, wonderfully easy just to turn the dial on your SEM and be able to zoom in now to 200 times magnification. And we say, yep, there certainly is something there. And really, we could see more surface detail, uh, some of that topography, but also the contrast that shows us the grooves and the ridges on the material, as well as a little bit uh, deeper look onto the, um, uh, the, the contamination. Is it something on top of the um, surface, or is it within the material? So by going into uh, electron microscopy, you get these added benefits of the higher magnification, more detail to understand the nature of your defect. And uh, another similar example that I had just yesterday, here at EDEX, we were looking at uh, a uh, returned detecting unit that had failed. We could see that under the optical microscope that the detector window was really not looking like it was in good shape, but, uh, but we weren't sure whether there were actually holes on the surface or contamination on top of the surface. So the, um, what we end up doing is putting into the SEM and uh, doing a, a detailed analysis of the EDS detector window to see what was the cause for the failure. So really, um, we were able to then see, confirm uh, that there were not any holes, they were actually surface contamination. And now as we go to our highest magnification uh, for this particular sample that we'll be working at, of course uh, 600x is um, relatively low mag, but easily within the range of entry level and tabletop microscopes. And we could see the feature of interest on the surface uh, of, the, of the sample. And you could see the contamination a little bit more clearly as the dark splotch. Now we'll ask the question again, what is it? With EDS microanalysis, we can determine what it actually is based on chemical composition or materials characterization. And a quick spectrum collection from the full field of view, so the entire image itself, good area, bad area, shows that, sure enough, it's titanium, as we expected, because it's a titanium clip. Uh, but it also has some other small peaks um, which might be suspect. So let's explore this further. Here's where we activate our multi-point analysis capability. So we work from our electron image, and we place our electron beam in a number of different areas. And really easy here, um, quick and easy science experiment. You place the beam on a good area, the substrate or the matrix or the background of the area that, uh, that looks normal. And then you place the beam on an area that doesn't look uh, normal, where you have those dark splo uh, splotches. So uh, we can do several different areas for the multi-point collection to gather our chemical information. And so the spectrum from the base material looks a whole lot cleaner, doesn't it? This shows us just our titanium K line and our titanium L line. And those are the two major peaks at this accelerating voltage. We see both of those. Those arise from the different uh, electron orbital shells and the X-ray interaction that arises from uh, ejection of an electron, but that's a topic for another time or for one of our training classes. So this is pure titanium, uh, showing both of the expected titanium peaks. Now, when we collect from the area that didn't look so uh, clean, 
we could see that this is where our other elements are present, um, silicon, sulfur, chlorine, potassium. And um, as a quick overview, um, even just the other day when I was collecting the spectrum, my colleague said, oh, a salt. Um, so uh, potassium and chlorine. So for somebody experienced in the world of chemistry and microscopy, you see potassium and chlorine and you think salt and also uh, potential uh, human contamination. And the best way to look at the overall details is to compare the good with the not good. So the base material is the spectrum in red showing our titanium, and the bad area shows the outline, the blue spectrum, and you can see that those contamination peaks, the chlorine, the sulfur, the potassium, are all associated with the, um, the bad area. Uh, there's also a, a sodium peak in there as well, so uh, various uh, types of salts. And in fact, I still remember some of my early days at EDAX uh, doing a sample analysis and a report, and my manager saying to me, do a uh, collection of the matrix general area and a collection of the bad area and do an overlay. So this is a routine that is well established within the uh, microanalytical realm. So that is our first example of a quick spot analysis collection that gives you a confirmation for visual inspection that goes further than just what your optical or your eyes can do, and, tell, and it tells you what your chemistry is from the contaminated or suspect area. In this second example, we'll go a little bit deeper with the raw materials verification. And in this scenario, uh, we might be in a manufacturing environment, and we have purchased our raw material from our supplier, and we have a block of this raw material. Before we begin cutting the material, processing it, treating it, whatever we do to turn that raw material into our final product, we probably want to make sure that what we got from our supplier is what we were expecting to get. And this is something that would be incorporated throughout the design and quality control process as well. But it gives you a quick way of making sure that what you're expecting it to be is what it actually is before you invest your production time on it. Also, um, we could use alloy identification and verification to determine whether the compound is within specification uh, or uh, tolerances of our expected material as well. So we'll start with a quick analysis from that block of material. And we collect our spectrum for, in this case, uh, a decent amount of count rate. Uh, these days, I'd say anywhere between 10 and 20,000 counts per second is a, is a decent count rate, um, kind of a, a low count rate for spectrum collection. If we go to mapping, we're usually in the tens of thousands, 50,000 to 100,000 counts per second. And for much higher mapping, we could even go into the hundreds of thousands of counts per second, even still without compromising quality. But in this case, we'll do a spectrum collection. And I did it for a little bit longer, 30-second collection time. Typically, my collections are about 10 seconds these days, but, um, but I did this once for 30 seconds. And so here's where I'll define some terminology intrinsic to a microanalyst's vocabulary. Um, but for those of you who might be exploring microanalysis for the first time, we'll talk about qualitative analysis. What qualitative analysis means is what is in your sample, or in this case, what peaks are in your spectra. And a little bit more terminology is whether you have major contributions or components. So in this case, the iron peak is nice and high. And then you also have some low level or minor constituents, like our silicon and our molybdenum. And there's also potential for some trace elements as well. And so we say major components are between 10 and 100% of our const uh, constituents of our sample. Minor components are 1% to 10% of our material. And trace components are from the limits of detection, say 0.1% to 1% itself. And even within those 
major, minor, and trace, we have some error tolerances where we say what's the limits of detection and what's the uh, confidence interval of the statistically correct. And we'll usually say for major elements, we're usually 2 to 5 percent uh, concentration correctness. Um, one, uh, for minor elements, we'll be maybe 5 to 10 percent. And for trace, we could be 10 percent to 20 percent or more, depending upon whether uh, we're at the limit of detection. These statistics actually increase with uh, collection time or with count rate. So where I said I started at a relatively low CPS value, 20,000 counts per second, we might want to, if we wanted to increase our confidence, our statistics, we could work at a higher count rate or we could also work at a longer collection time. So for those of you beginning your analysis, if you want to improve your uh, concentration uh, error intervals, you could collect for longer time or higher count rates. And so we see our elements that are present um, as suspected. And then uh, alloy, we have our iron, chromium, manganese, uh, nickel, and then a little bit amount of silicon and molybdenum. And then we click on the quant button, and the quant uh, uh, brings us to how much material or elements are within our material. So qualitative is what elements are present. Quantitative is how much of those elements are present. And in the world of X-ray microanalysis, we report in terms of weight percent or atomic percent. And we also have some more flexibility with different output types like oxides. And you could do some compound formulations with the oxygens in there and even do some uh, formula approximations with your atomic percentages. In this case, uh, if we were to look at these concentrations and determine what it is, it would probably require analytical experience or at least some Google searching and comparisons to what different stainless steel types are. So the numbers are a little bit small, but they show, uh, I think it's something like probably around 70% iron and 15% uh, chromium, uh, something like that. And so if we really wanted to know what that is, we would actually either have to have the experience to know off the top of our heads what stainless steel numbers are what con uh, equal what concentrations of the different elements, or we could look them up against a uh, Google search. And we could even see in the software that we report uh, pie charts that gives us uh, the overall quick idea of the composition. But that doesn't give us the full solution of what alloy it actually is. So here's where we move along to a spectrum library matching uh, routine. And this is a software feature that allows the analyst to take an unknown sample or material, or your raw material block, for example, and easily compare it to a user-generated, previously collected library. It means that you take your unknown and you press a button. Basically, you start with your um, sample, you click on the Collect button, and then you click on the Match button. So it's as easy as, as two different buttons to press, Collect, and then Match. And of the three examples that we'll show here, this one's the actual easiest uh, routine to do. When you do a spectrum library match fitting based on the spectrum itself, so the spectrum matches to the unknown spectrum, the routine is just overlaying the unknown spectrum to the previously collected known spectra. So you don't even need to do any peak ID. So it's just looking at the spectrum fingerprint. Zero peak ID, zero user knowledge, just clicking on that collect button and then the match button. And so uh, that's uh, the, the quickest, easiest way to do a match. And in this case, um, you can see here that we have, um, I can't quite see the full screen, but I think it's somewhere around 95% fit uh, correction, corrected with uh, stainless steel 316. The next closest match is stainless steel 304, and that has a 91% fit. So really a good confident fit on stainless steel 316 at uh, about 95%. Really great way of saying this is what our raw material is. This is the alloy that it is. Now we go a little bit further to in depth to the second way of doing a raw materials verification. And this is with a concentration match fitting. This increases our accuracy and gives us greater confidence in our uh, match of our unknown against our database. But it does take a little bit more user interaction or user control because you need to identify your peaks in order to calculate your concentrations. 
So if the user collects the spectrum and then identifies the peaks, whether they're done by automatic mode or manual mode, you could then have the routine match against the concentrations. You actually don't have to perform the concentration yourself. The, the match program does it for you. But you, you then click on the match button, and it sets to match against the concentration. So basically, iron is 70%, chromium is 15%. How close do all those concentrations match against all of the alloys that we have in our library? And you can see in this case, still stainless steel 316 gets the top spot, but it gets it with an increased accuracy of 97% accuracy of the unknown compared to the known stainless steel 316. So we're pretty sure that the block that we put in the microscope and collected x-rays from is stainless steel 316. And the third example of the use of the spectrum library match solution is doing concentration match fittings, but with different KVs or even different collection conditions. And this becomes really important because we can have a database library of, one, of a certain KV, say 20 KV, which is where all the work was done at so far. But now let's say we collect our unknown at 15 KV or is on a different system, and so we have other variables at play. How well does the match routine work for altogether different systems or different conditions? Well, we could see here, again, it, this time it reported only the top two closest matches, but again, it, it, it selected stainless steel 316, and I think it's, again, somewhere at 95%. So even with the added flexibility of working at different conditions, different instruments, you still get an accurate identification of your alloy material. It also means that the libraries that are created can be shared between systems. So if you have multiple EDS systems uh, sitting on your uh, production line and you use the spectrum match function, you can use all the same library between all of your systems on the production line. Likewise, if you're a very large company and you have multiple manufacturing sites, you could have all the manufacturing sites using the same library, even if you're working on uh, different types of microscopes, just so long as you're using the uh, edX team software routine, you're able to match using that same spectrum match library. And uh, you might, for more information about the spectrum match functionality, you might want to refer back to the spectrum match webinar, which we did in early 2015, and that has a little bit more details and examples for a variety of industries uh, on this topic. Here's our first interactive poll, so something that we're excited to, uh, to work with you on today. And as we have such a good group, a variety of users from the industrial areas, uh, we'd like to see what answer is most important to you as you do your day-to-day -day work. So when we say answer, we're looking for what type of solution, you know, what's your goal when you do your EDS uh, data collection. Are you looking for spectral analysis, which tells you that you have iron in your sample, or you have a high carbon area in the dark area, or uh, maybe there's silicon in your sample, you weren't expecting it, so what, what elements are present? Or are you looking for quantitative analysis? So what are the concentrations? How much chromium is in my sample? Is this a high chromium area or a low chromium area? Do I have oxygen in there? And if so, at what percent oxidized um, is my sample? And finally, the third choice is library match solution. So you put your sample in. You're not sure what it is, or you, you have an idea, but uh, you just want to click the match button and match it against a previously known uh, collected library. So for example, you put a, a mineral in there, unknown, and you click on match, and it comes up that it matches a um, uh, potassium feldspar, for example, whatever uh, might be. One of our interns last year did a really exciting work using the library database match on some sand that she collected from Hawaii and looking at what minerals were within, uh, within the sand compared to a mineral library. Uh, so I'll, I'll give another few seconds. If you can wrap up your submission, uh, just click on your choice and click on the Submit button. Uh, we would love to hear your input about what you're looking for when you do your EDS analysis. All right.
So the, uh, the results show that about half of you are looking to do a spectral analysis. So really um, a, a, a nice quick spectral collection that says uh, what materials, what elements you have in your sample. This is, uh, this is great. Um, there are an even greater amount of you that, um, that look at the quantitative analysis or the concentrations of your materials within them. And I'm um, guessing that uh, the poll allows you to select more than one answer because we have a, a small, uh, smaller group of people looking for the library match solution, so the database matching to say, okay, I'm not sure what this is, but I click on match and it tells me that it's uh, calcite or that it's stainless steel 316. So this is, that's very good. The, uh, the third choice might be lower because not everybody has that. It is a little bit of a newer routine. So uh, maybe next year if we do this poll again, uh, we'll have a, a growing number of users uh, using database match solution. Of course, uh, mapping is not in there. Um, we didn't get there yet, but, but we'll get there. So thank you very much for, uh, for the nice turnout for the, the polling. This, this helps us um, look at where the, the industry is going. Okay, so let's move on to the industrial analysis and the QA, QC labs. And these, uh, this topic is going to be more towards the dedicated regulated industries um, using QA, QC and comparing to the first topic, which was production line inspection, where basically something looked different, so a production guy uh, flagged it and pulled it out um, for inspection. Whereas in the regulated industry, um, you have regulated sampling or batch sampling uh, built into the, to your manufacturing process. So QA is basically um, building a quality by design. So you're selecting your materials and your processes that are building quality into your manufacturing process to assure the necessary level of quality and performance. So you know how it needs to perform design, engineer your product to perform at that level using these components. QC is where we're looking at controls that include product inspection where there's a sampling of material that comes off the production line, say batches that come off, maybe five out of every 100 widgets that are made uh, need to come off the line to be examined visually. And that's where they're not selected, not necessarily selected um, specifically, but they're just a, a random batch sampling to ensure that the quality is maintained throughout the process. Um, that also includes alloy verification, visual inspection, uh, kind of lines up with some of the topics that we talked about already, but this is more of a dedicated batch sampling. So now we'll go into a, a QA example um, that shows um, a little bit of the quality control on the product inspections, kind of tying all of these concepts in together. And really what it is is we're looking at a good part versus a bad part. So we know what the material is has been designed to look like. We know what a good part is supposed to be. And then we pull a part off the production line and we see a bad part. So something is, is not good. This is being flagged at the, um, at the uh, QC level. And so let's, uh, let's look at that in a little bit more detail. It might be hard to see here, but we'll get some um, larger images. The good part is basically the same throughout with a couple of surface contaminants, which are kind of hard to avoid sometimes. The bad part actually has some uh, gray, lower, uh, lighter gray areas that appear to be built into the matrix of the material themselves. So not a contaminant on the surface, but rather inside of the matrix. And so here we'll show a phase map or a chemical image. So the previous images were um, electron images showing the uh, gray levels. Now what we're looking at is actually an X-ray map showing our elemental components where each phase represents a compound. So for example, um, silicon and oxygen create the compound quartz or sand. And so one of the phases that we see here is actually uh, FaO2 or sand, and I think that's the orange phase that we have here. And so if we look at the overall composition of this material, um, the material, by the way, is an engineering thermal plastic. It's uh, a plastic part that is made and designed for precision parts with, within uh, components. The advantage is it gives dimensional stability, so it holds its shape and form very well, even under 
uh, temperature changes or pressure changes. So really important in the manufacturing environment, and especially with that dimensional stability means that you could compress it or you could pull it, but it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't break or, or break apart or bend um, by design. And so then when we look a little bit closer at the contaminants, we see that the matrix or the plastic itself is red, uh, but then we have a 19% of our sampling area that we collected from has a higher amount of carbon in it. So um, although the plastic is, is oxygen and carbon, we see a higher percentage of carbon within the blue phase. And uh, we can investigate that further in a moment. We also see a silicate material, aluminum material, a calcium-containing phase. Um, all of these are compounds. So uh, the um, calcium-containing phase is calcium, carbon, and oxygen. And so uh, we might assume or infer that that's calcite. Now let's look in greater detail so that we don't have to make any of those assumptions. So we look at our plastic material and we see that the carbon and oxygen ratios are these two peaks on the left-hand side, carbon being the lower one, oxygen being a little bit higher. That, that describes the chemistry of our plastic. Now we look at the 19% blue area, and we could see that there's more carbon in this area compared to oxygen. And so that, uh, that tells us that uh, organic uh, component or compound, some, uh, some other material that's high carbon in there, um, uh, maybe a, a composition uh, change of the resin uh, or the plastic itself or a, an organic component. And then we look at another contaminant, which is calcium carbon and oxygen. And if we were to do a, a quantitative analysis, we would be able to determine that the atomic percentages line up pretty closely to CaCO3. And we say, OK, there's a calcite in there, which is also uh, something that comes from sedimentary rock or limestone, even uh, shells you know, from the beach. And that also pairs up nicely with our next one, which uh, is our silicon, um, high silicon and oxygen in there. Again, we know silicon and oxygen phase compound comes together is, is probably quartz. And we could, again, do those concentrations. So it shows us that our one image showing our matrix in red, our highest contaminant in blue, and the various compounds, calcite, limestone, and uh, sand are in the purple and the orange. And we could verify the uh, constituents um, visually by looking at just the elements themselves and confirming hot spots. So for example, we said we thought those carbon areas were some sort of additional resin or organic material. And when we look at the green carbon map, we see there's some hot spots of carbon. And then we look at our uh, red map, which is silicon coming from the orange phase, and we see hot spots of silicon. Now, of course, that's just the silicon map. If we were to do an oxygen map, it would probably line up with those to also have hot spots for silicon dioxide. And there's also some aluminum, which is also curious for um, maybe some metal uh, themselves. Of course, uh, aluminum is readily, readily found. Um, in nature, so it's possible that that somehow uh, got into the material itself. What this is telling us is that this bad part has a host of different materials ranging from, say, calcite, limestone, quartz. Probably those were fillers. And um, the manufacturer of this particular raw material probably scooped up a, a bunch of sand or filler materials and uh, added to the batch to make more from less of the expensive plastic and uh, stretching the batch, so to speak. Of course, uh, when the goal is dimensional stability and you put sand in there, you compress the part that has a lot of sand, you're going to fracture your component. And sure enough, that is exactly the reason that this manufacturer came to the EDAX app lab looking for what is that. They said, these pieces are failing when we put a load on them. And we were able to tell them this is why. It's because you have sand and other brittle, um, uh, materials in there that embrittle the material and cause the fracturing. So let's, um, let's talk a little bit different take on it. So now we're looking at the features themselves, so not necessarily the answers or the solutions. 
So they line up similar to what the solutions are. But if we could take a second poll and think about your day-to-day -day workflow. And um, the important thing is uh, workflow here in this poll. Uh, where do you spend most of your time uh, on, in the software? What features are you using the most? Are you uh, collecting and analyzing, uh, collecting your spectra to figure out what's in the sample? Uh, are you doing quantitative analysis routinely? So do you do uh, quant all the time or just occasionally? Do you do phase maps? Um, or do you do individual element maps to look at the hotspots? So phase maps will give you one image with the overall chemistry, and the individual element maps show you where the hotspots of individual elements are. And uh, you would kindly select one or more of those and click on the Submit button. We'll move along to the results momentarily. Okay, a lot of great questions coming in too. This is this is great. Thank you for for asking questions. So I'll move along to the results. Uh, excellent, uh, a good range of usage of the different features within the software. Nice to see. Um, we have uh, uh, not as many people using phase mapping. Uh, let's uh, let's turn the tides on that. Uh, phase mapping is one image that describes the overall chemistry. You know, we look at an electron image, we see that we have a bright area, a dark area, but we don't know what it is. When we look at the phase map, we could see that it's um, mostly plastic with some sand in there, mostly plastic with sand and, uh, and calcite in there. Uh, let's, um, let's, phase maps are starting to be used, but let's, uh, let's use them every day. Element maps, this is great. Good traditional microscopy, uh, looking at the element hotspots, comparing elements together. Excellent. And uh, as expected, most of you guys are doing uh, spectral and quant. Very good. OK. So now we'll move on to the last topic. And uh, there's only a few slides on this topic here. So um, we'll, we'll get through in the next 10 minutes. So we have some time for the questions and answers. Uh, we've had some good questions that I saw. So in the educational environments, we're now seeing a growth of entry level and tabletop microscopes into primary and secondary schools. They are being used as enhancements to optical microscopes. So you know, we know that kids have been using optical microscopes for a really long time. And uh, now uh, they're being exposed to electron microscopes. I, uh, I saw my first electron microscope image in a textbook when I was about 15 years old. It was a red blood cell. I fell in love with electron microscopy. And here I am a whole bunch of years later still doing electron microscopy. So let's get these kids exposed to electron microscopy and grow new microanalysts. And um, electron microscopes and microanalysis allow our students to push scientific inquiries further. So it's not just about you know, what, is, what is it, what does it look like, but now it's saying, well, what is it composed of? You know, what, is that, uh, what is that area, uh, that dark spot in our, um, in our leaf? Um, you know, what is the composition of, um, of that chloroplast? Um, what materials are there, for example? And also a really nice benefit is that tabletop SEMs are portable and are set up really easily. Our, uh, our service guy who came in to install our microscope was just fantastic. And within just, I think, just a few minutes, within an hour, it was up and running. So really nice and easy to set up, transport, and uh, bring to multiple locations. So even if just, say, a school dr district purchases one, they could bring it to the various elementary schools, the uh, various um, uh, middle school or uh, high school classes. So um, bringing it to different classes. And even if um, whole towns themselves share uh, them with, between different towns, you can um, pool your resources. And um, the, the most exciting thing is that kids are getting excited about microscopy. Um, so my daughter is 12. She knows that I'm in uh, microscopy. A few weeks ago, she came home from school and said, hey, we did the optical microscope. Uh, we looked at stuff under the optical microscope today. And she was so excited that uh, she was able to get to 40 times magnification. She said, hey, mom, I saw something 40 times magnified. 
how high did your microscope go in your lab? And I was like, well, um, depends on what mode I'm in, but I'll say about 500,000 times or half a million times magnification. So she was a little bit blown away with that uh, several orders of magnitude difference between optical microscopes and electron microscopes. Um, and as far as the tabletop microscopes go, we're really not sacrificing on quality of them because they're pretty easily able to get into the tens of thousands of times magnification as well. So really, uh, the performance is there as well. So most people tell students to think big. And as microscopists, we tell our students to think small. And when you think small, the first thing that everybody thinks about is hair. We've been uh, taught in the real world uh, that hair is small. And uh, so yes, I guess technically in the real world, hair is small. But in the microscopy world, hair is actually kind of large. Uh, nonetheless, it makes a fantastic example when we're introducing new students to microscopy. And so we find a hair that, uh, that's been um, damaged here. And you can see that the fibrous areas have been pulled apart. Uh, basically, you're split end. And uh, so the image on the left is a lower mag showing that split end. And then the image on the right, uh, sorry for the charging there, but you could see uh, some of the, uh, the scales on the hair itself. So I'm able to see some of those details that you really can't um, quite get uh, in an optical microscope. And the first thing that we do when we look at our microanalysis of our biological materials, in this case the hair, we look at the low energy sensitivity. So anybody in bio biological sciences knows that carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, those are our main components for uh, everything biological. I still remember that being um, beat into me in, uh, in seventh grade, I think it was. Uh, so those are your main components. And it's also why X-ray microanalysis hasn't been huge in the biological world is because there have been some sacrifices to the low energy microanalysis performance. Nowadays, uh, there's a latest realm of SDD or silicon drift detectors. Those are our X-ray detectors. There's a new realm of SDD technology that's really well suited to explode microanalysis in the biological arena or environmental sciences arena. And that's with advancements to the detector window. So thinner window allows more of those light, low energy, weak x-rays to pass through the window and be detected with the detector. And uh, also changes to the formulation of those windows allow increased nitrogen sensitivity, which has been a, a traditional uh, challenge for the biological world. So uh, increased nitrogen uh, detection as well as the low elements in general. Uh, we also saw here, this is kind of fun, um, I really give kudos to my coworker who, uh, when I said there's, uh, there's sulfur in my hair, and he said you probably don't uh, wash all your shampoo out good enough, but, uh, but he nails it. Those, uh, the sodium lauryl sulfate, I think, is one of the, uh, the components of shampoo. So that's, uh, that's where that sulfur comes from, which was uh, always fun around here at the EDAX App Lab. Um, so let's use this spectra as a way of introducing additional uh, uh, terminology, as promised, to make this a little bit more educational for uh, maybe some of the uh, newer uh, users to microscopy and microanalysis. I look at this and I just see it's a beautiful spectrum. Um, what I mean by beautiful spectra, my peaks are nice and high, intense, as well as nicely separated. So the peaks resolve down to the baseline. They're separated. Carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are high intensity and fully resolved, meaning that the peak baseline goes down to the baseline uh, before it rises to the next peak. And that's what uh, resolution or resolving power of peaks is. Um, the two areas that we look at is the uh, intensity in the, in the y-axis, so how high is the peak, how many uh, counts in that peak. And the resolution is the x-axis, and that's our peak energy. So all different elements fall at different x-ray energies. That energy is down at the bottom, and each element has an energy range for the peak. That energy range is called the full width half maximum. So if you've ever seen FWHM or heard full width half max, what do we mean by that? We take the half the maximum peak intensity. So carbon peak is this high. We go about halfway up that peak. And then we measure the full width 
So how wide is that peak in this area here? And we report that value in energy volts, or EV, which is the uh, value here on the x-axis. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but I'm sort of pointing to the middle of the peak. And then the x-axis is the width of that peak in EV increments. And so that's, uh, that's what we mean by full width half max. Um, and then we take those components, um, those, those, term, those um, components a little bit further and introduce more terms, sensitivity and resolution. And these are relevant to general analytical chemistry. Um, so really, any uh, analytical chemistry will look for something signal to noise. So um, how, how much signal do we get? And what's our base background noise, uh, baseline, whatever it might be in the different areas? Specific to EDS microanalysis, we look at peak to background. So our spectrum peak and our characteristic Bremsstrahlung or background. And we say, how uh, high is our peak to background? So uh, how intense is our peak? And the sensitivity relates to detectability. Because if you have a low amount of something, you really want to pull that peak above the background and increase the detectability. The benefits. Um, the translate of uh, the increased signal to noise or detectability that we get from the latest technology, so thinner windows and better transmissivity, the benefits that we get are lower limits of detection or better limits of detection, I should say. So we need even smaller peaks to uh, pull above the background um, uh, or smaller amount of signal to pull above the background because the detector itself is more sensitive and you, you only need less amount of material. Uh, element in the material to detect it. And that also helps us with trace analysis. So that low amount, even if it's distributed and just say fine particulates, we're able to detect those as well. And then the next uh, factor is resolution. Resolution is the ability to resolve peaks. And resolve really means to tell the difference between. So can we tell the difference between carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen that we saw on the uh, previous example? And sure, we, we definitely were. So we were able to separate those peaks. And there were also um, nice narrow peaks. And this is why when I, say, uh, when I said early on that, uh, that spectrum was a nice, beautiful spectrum, and that's because my eyeball looks at it, and I see a nice, finely resolved set of peaks. My nitrogen is uh, nice and high in intensity. It's fully resolved from its neighboring carbon and oxygen. And the peaks go down to the baseline before it starts to, uh, to become a peak for the next element in sequence. That's, of course, a, a big performance specification, too. So uh, on the final note here is just looking at the relationship between sensitivity and resolution. They are both very important when you look at detector performance because sensitivity, you need to have enough signal to detect above the background. But resolution, you need to resolve it between the neighboring one, uh, the neighboring elements. And there, when you only have so much available signal, so for example, in a trace amount, you only have a little bit of signal. You really want the best resolution possible because it's going to condense that small amount of signal into fewer channels or fewer uh, peak increments. So that gives you the better ability to pull it above the background. And so if we look at here on the, uh, the overlay, between two different detector types, basically we're looking at the older type detector window in red and the newer type detector window in the outline. You could see the nitrogen intensity is greatly improved. The oxygen intensity is greatly improved. Actually, the performance all around is greatly improved, but it's normalized to the, uh, to the carbon uh, peak. So uh, you could see the great benefit of the sensitivity, detectability, transmissivity for your low energy elements. And also, now here's where, and we say, what well, has the better low energy performance? We're typically talking in terms of intensity, but also resolution comes into play too, because we're able to resolve between the neighbors when you have a higher uh, peak intensity. And so, um, a moment ago, I said that was the final example, but I did end up uh, having a little bit of fun with, uh, with the, this is ultimately the final example. Here's something I think that we all can relate to. It was something in my everyday life that uh, really challenged me. And so I thought I'd bring the example uh, to you guys. Uh, it also ties in with failure analysis, quality control, and all that. Um, so um, I don't uh, have the ability to ask you for any guesses. I didn't create a poll on this one. 
um, but I wonder if anybody has guesses. And um, if not, um, I'll just move along to uh, to show the elemental uh, constituents, the components. We've got tin in the bright pink, aluminum um, in the yellow wires, and then we've got some carbon in green, and also some chlorine in uh, in this area here. This is actually the neck of the white wire in your iPhone charger. So I usually go through um, maybe two or three chargers per year because you know it bends back and forth, and uh, ultimately it failed, and that uh, annoyed me sufficiently and cost enough money sufficiently for me to bring it into the lab and take a look at it. And you could see that on the right-hand side, there's definitely some mechanical uh, damage. You could see that the, those wires are twisted. This is like the end of the broken part here. The wires have twisted and deformed. But also, the chemistry shows that some of this area here is not just carbon contamination, but it's chlorine. So that probably means uh, the PVC component of the wire itself maybe got in between the aluminum wires, which uh, maybe is not, uh, not what we need it to be. Um, so great science experiment for your kids and tabletop microscopes and microanalysis. Um, you know, take an everyday problem and understand it a little bit more deeply with increased magnification and chemical maps. So thank you for um, attending today's webinar. The summary um, is on this slide, and I'll move into one or two of the Q&A uh, next. So today's microanalysts are looking for new tools basically to, uh, to meet the evolving marketplace, increasing productivity, but still not compromising quality. Two important things, get more done, but don't sacrifice quality. And as a result of different industries exploring microscopy further, you could see these new markets um, because nowadays you could quickly and easily do your uh, electron microscopy and microanalysis to meet your in industry goals. And finally, as a manufacturer, we are continually adapting our microanalysis tools to meet these goals and to help uh, you users attain your goals uh, in this ever-changing landscape. So I will move over to Q&A. And I saw one that, um, uh, so here's uh, one. Um, the uh, SDD stands for Silicon Drift Detector. It is a detector technology that's been around for uh, commercially about 10 to 15 years. It has uh, overwhelmingly replaced the uh, silicon lithium detector. And um, this, uh, the silicon drift detector technology, uh, we have a few webinars that show it, uh, as well as a variety of product materials I can explain in more detail. Um, it is, uh, gives you a faster collection time. And um, as we showed the last few examples, the latest window uh, detector designs increase your uh, transmissivity across the board, but specifically for your low energy elements. Um, how do I separate the matrix and the contaminants? That's by using spot mode or multi-point analysis. Place your beam on the matrix of the material, you know, the good area, and collect a spectrum. And then place your beam on the bad area, collect a spectrum, and then do an overlay to show uh, what elements are present in the contaminant versus the matrix. Um, I did say the library is user generated. That's correct. And this is so that it can be tailored for your specific uh, applications and materials. That being said, we at EDAX do have a few examples. We have a mineral library and a bit of an alloy library too. So we can certainly work with you to, um, to supply you with an alloy library of your choosing. Um, the match button, uh, where is the match button located? I love this question. It means that uh, you want to use the function, and that's great. I love it. Um, you might not have that option available. Um, it's uh, team software, and um, it's, a, it's an option that needs to be activated. Um, we have some materials that show uh, how you can activate that, or you could contact your um, local uh, representative to, uh, to get that activated. The nice thing is it's just an update to your license key. It is a purchase, so once you purchase that function, um, we send you the updated license key. You just simply copy and paste that onto your computer and launch the team software, and it will be there in the Spectrum Tools area located below your quantification uh, area. Uh, what I mean by limits of detection is that 
what is the lowest possible amount of an element that we can detect. So how much of it do we need to be able to pull the signal above the baseline or signal to noise, uh, noise baseline, or how much peak do we need above background. So as we get close to that limits of detection, we're getting a higher error interval. Typically, limits of detection are anywhere uh, about 0.1% is just a very, very broad number. Um, as you go to light elements, it's a little bit poorer. As you go to heavier elements, you can get a little bit better on your LODs. Um, um, how do we clean the detector lens? Uh, traditionally, the polymer windows, please, please do not clean those polymer windows. Um, just yesterday, I was looking at a failed detector window. Uh, you don't want to, you don't want to clean your uh, SDD polymer window. Nowadays, with the uh, latest SDD detectors with silicon nitride window, uh, my colleague Jens has exposed uh, those to plasma cleaning for like over 100 hours. Uh, some of those experiments have been great. So uh, you can plasma clean your um, silicon nitride window of the latest SDDs, and uh, plasma cleaners are everywhere in the SEMs these days. So, so you're welcome to pop that onto the chamber and clean your EDS detector with silicon nitride window. And I think that brings us to uh, to our time. Thank you for all of you who attended, and um, thank you for those of you who answered the polls and had the questions. I've really enjoyed working with you today on these. Cheers. <laughs>